Welcome to Pretty Lies and Alibis. Join us as we seek the truth and travel the long road to justice. Hi, everybody. It's Sunday. Time for another episode of Pretty Lies and Alibis. I am Gigi. What's good, Fruit Loop? Uh... I'm I'm still having a travel hangover. Yeah, you guys clocked some miles. We did. We did. We uh I forgot to figure it up. I was gonna figure it up, but we made we made some time on the road. Every time I tracked you guys you were in the car. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, but you guys went to Birmingham and, and did some business for your uncle, took my oldest with you. Oh my goodness, we had the best time. Yeah, she had a great time, but I have to say, I've never seen that kid so tired as she was last night. Oh yeah, yesterday in the car, she was done. She was like, because we had a chance, we could have stayed over and then came home today. Yeah. And she's like, no, I'm ready to go. I'm like, I told her, I said, it's up to you. But we ate the best barbecue that I've ever eaten. She brought home some barbecue sauce, and right when you guys got back into town last night, I put in an order order on Uber Eats for a steak, and so um, we were eating, and and she says, you have to try this barbecue sauce, so I literally dipped my steak in that barbecue sauce the entire time. It was so good. Isn't it good? It it was, it's called, and a shout out to Ben, who listens to us, he shot us some names of places to go. And it's called Saul's Barbecue. Um, and the lady who waited on us was Lisette. And she was awesome. Um, it was a cool little place. Uh, we can put some pictures on our social media, I think. Yeah, we'll do that. Um, of the place or whatever. But it was just, it, it literally, it was like this old place. And it had this the smoker thing in the wall. So it was, it was just, it was really good. Yeah, that sounds really good. I mean, the barbecue sauce alone, I could have just turned the bottle up. Yeah. So we went and uh, the Piggly Wiggly, and we laughed because I was like, oh, the Piggly Wiggly. Um, We went and got their sauces at the Piggly Wiggly um, because they sell it there. So yeah, it was really good. Then we had cookies from Dream Cakes, which is a, a business a few doors up from the barbecue place. And oh my goodness, it was this peanut butter cookie, something another. Oh, it was so good. You guys just had you a fine little time. Oh yeah. I especially love giving her spending money. And an hour and a half after you guys hit Birmingham, she calls and says, I found some antiques. I'm broke. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She's been it all in one place. But yeah. it, it, she got some good stuff. She got her. some really, really cool stuff. So I appreciate you taking her and she had a blast. And I think you guys are heading back in a couple of weeks and I might just have to tag along for some Saul's barbecue. Oh yeah. Yeah. Most definitely. Yeah. We went there twice. Oh, did you really? Yeah, we actually had time, and we were like, okay, let's go back. (laughs) And then we bought a cooler and ice, and we took it with us, but then we ate it before we left the stadium, so. Oh, that's great. Yeah. It's a really glowing review for Saul's Barbecue. Oh, yeah. Go eat there. They have, like, three different things. (laughs) The juke joint, Saul's juke joint or something down there somewhere. It has music and stuff there. That's cool. Yeah, the one we went to, I think, may have been the original because it was smaller, but... Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was good. Sometimes those little hole-in-the-wall barbecues have the best barbecue you'll find. Oh, yeah. There's just something to be said for these places that are 50, 60 years old. Yeah. That are still kicking it. The ribs looked amazing. And you know Taylor is a rib eater. Oh, yeah. But she was like, "Uh -uh, I'm still getting the pulled pork because it was so good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. I'm glad y'all have fun. Yeah, you had fun with uh, Sherlock. (sighs) Okay. First of all, thank you to everybody who gave me tips on how to get this cat home when he decided to sneak out for the whole night. Uh, He came strutting in that next morning like nothing had happened. And so I have an extra room in my house, which is very close to my bedroom, and I'm able to shut a door off. And we had to get him out of the studio because he had already destroyed a pair of my beats. (laughs) He chewed through the wires. And so we just decided with all our new equipment, we didn't want to risk having to, to purchase replacement wires. So I put I, I made this awesome little cat room. It's got like a little jungle gym in there. And so last night I said, well, I'm just going to shut my bedroom door. He's got plenty. He's got two rooms literally and a big, huge walk-in closet to kind of play in. So he was asleep at my feet. And by 2.30, he was awake. <laughs> 
So he jumps. I have a really tall dresser jumping up on that. And every time he jumps, he makes this sound and it's like, (laughs) so then you would hear him hit and then he would meow really loud and then he would run across my gut. So I would sit up, you know, just sit straight up as soon as he ran across the, my old dog thunder, who's 12. He just, at one point about three 30, he comes and stands by my bed and stares at me like, are you serious? Get the cat out of here. Cause normally my dogs sleep by our bed. And, um, so I open the door to where he can run through the house, just thinking he'll go somewhere. He goes in my son's room. My son throws him out of the room, slams the door, goes in Sarah Rose's room, opens the door, throws the cat out. Taylor's texting me, get your cat. So finally at 4 a.m., I brought him back here in the studio and he's been whining all day. He's just got to get fixed. Yeah. He's got to get fixed. I bought a tent. To let him go outside where, because my luck, he's going to get hit by a car or attacked. And then I have to go spend a couple of grand on a cat. Yeah. And so I'm trying to prevent that. So we had some wind today and the cat's out in the tent and I'll look outside and that tent is rolling across (laughs) the front yard with the cat in it. (laughs) And he's trying to get a grip on something, but it's just, (laughs) yeah, the bottom's like plastic or whatever tents are made of. So I'm tired, and I'm just, at this point, uh, I'm thinking about, oops, letting him out. He's going to be an outside cat from now on. Oh, my gosh. It's just been a whole thing. I think I might leash train him, though. Oh, here we go. This is going to be like the potty training. No, I mean, how hard can it be to leash train him? Okay, how many cats have you ever seen walking with somebody on a leash? Like (laughs) once in Venice Beach in California. (laughs) On the the West Coast. Yeah. Yeah. But hey, we, I got some tent stakes you can use to stake that tent down. Well, okay. So then I d- after it collapsed, because it, it was literally like a tumbleweed going across my yard with the cat in it. Um, I, I took four of my small screwdrivers out there because I didn't have stakes and I was going to drive them down. And now I can't even figure out how to get the, the tent back up. It's the, what, what do you call them? The little poles. They're all messed up. And so I just give up. Whatever. Oh. Rolling, rolling, rolling. He's more work than my newborns were, and he's much louder. Yeah. You want a cat? No, I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. I'm going to ask your mom if she oh, wants a little better cut, not. cuddly kitty. <laughs> you better not. Oh. Uh, cats are, we were talking about this. Cats are just, they're, they're, they're their own person. And if they know you don't really care for them, they come at you that much worse. But I care for him, and he knows No, this. I'm not saying you. I'm saying me. Oh. <laughs> like, I'm not a cat. Okay, I don't hate cats, but they're just not my favorite thing. Yeah, mine either. <laughs> and he harasses me something horrible. Oh, yeah, it's funny. Yeah. So, yeah. anyways, I, we had somebody ask us, um, what is it like for females that are in prison for child murder? And my friend who's in prison, she is in with some pretty high-profile inmates, one of which is a female that had a pretty mainstream media case uh, that is in prison for murder. And um, she actually emailed me this weekend and told me this inmate had been getting beaten and robbed so bad that she actually attacked a prison guard just to get put in segregation to get a break. Oh, wow. So if that gives you any idea of how women killers that kill their children are treated in prison i'm not sure if it's that way across the board but this uh this woman's case was big um so that's an example somebody had just asked that and literally the next day without me even asking her she because i'd asked her are you in there with this person and she was like yes i am and uh not pretty that's crazy not pretty at all but it gives insight into uh, what it's going to be like for Lori when she gets in there. So Yeah, if, if we ever get to trial, we've got that delay. Uh, there is They did uh, do a hearing on June 9th uh, at 9 a.m., and it looks like that's going to be a scheduling conference. Yeah, about those dates. Yeah. Yeah, so they didn't have to sit there and, yeah. It's not going to be anything uh, super... You'll, still, you'll get to see Maine sit there with his long face. Yeah. And yeah. then maybe... Prior will say something. Yeah, I'm keeping my eye on the Idaho Cases of Interest webpage to see if anything is updated. But other than this, there hasn't been anything posted really in three and a half weeks other than this scheduling conference. So it's slow going. It's going to be slow going for a very long time. 
people are already getting frustrated with the delays and it's just the way it goes. Yeah. So Colby had a birthday. He did. Happy birthday, Colby. Um, yeah. His wife did a surprise video for him that I was able to watch and it was wonderful. It was so cool. Uh, there was a lot of people, obviously, that Colby knew and loved that were wishing him happy birthday. At the end, there was some Christian rap artist that wished him a happy birthday. He was very shocked. That's cool. And they also had a text from Tylee to him on previous birthdays. And then they had the sweetest video of JJ uh, wishing Colby a happy birthday. Oh, that's cool. So it had to be bittersweet for him. And um, he did take some of the well wishes out for privacy reasons. and uh, But it was really, really sweet to watch. I hope he had a great day. He seemed like he was very happy in that video, very surprised to see from a lot of people. So it was nice to see him smile, and then he got very emotional at times. And so hopefully he had a great day with his cute little family. Yeah, that's cool. All right, so what else? Um, We're going to do this. um, We're going to pick back up on our A A Glimpse at Life series today. And a lot of people have been very interested in hearing what it was like for my friend to give birth while incarcerated. So we're going to jump into that. Um, yeah, this is good stuff. It's good. It's heartbreaking. It's very sad. Yeah. Um, so I think the thing that bothers me uh, in just doing research about women who are pregnant when they're incarcerated, there's no, as far as I can tell, there's no mandatory standard of care for women who are incarcerated and pregnant. Yeah, that's, it's, I know I've said this 10 times, but it's, it's crazy because the, the baby didn't ask to be born into any of what's going on. Mm-hmm. So you would think there would be some standard care to help take care of the baby. Right. It, but it doesn't seem that across the board there are standards that they're kept to. Um, one of the common complaints, according to her and other women, is during the pregnancy, it is very hard in a normal sense. And, and I, I told you guys the last episode, I gained 80 pounds with Sarah Rose. Uh, you're always hungry when you're pregnant. At least I was. And there's no guarantee that you're going to get more than your three meals a day. That's great. Oh, my goodness. She said that there were times where she maybe got an extra thing of milk, but sometimes the milk was bad and she couldn't drink it. So I can't um, imagine not having a fridge to run to. Now, we know that these women are where they are because of decisions they made. But statistically, women are mostly in prison compared to men for nonviolent offenses. So you're looking at a lot of addiction issues. You're looking at maybe fraud. But. I think the overwhelming majority of women that are in are in for nonviolent crimes. So I just think that as a whole, after researching beyond what my friend said, we need, you know, there's a lot of people out there who care about the unborn and, and make it a mission. And we need to be voices for these women getting care while they're in prison. Because the thing is, these kids are going to go out into society. Yeah. And um, we need to make sure these babies are being taken care of. Well, I think I remember with with your pregnancies and some of my other friends who've had kids, the food you eat is different. I mean, there's vitamins you have to take. There's, mm-hmm. um, I know, like you can't have regular lunch meat. Well, it there are... Like you're supposed to warm it or something? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, there's certain cheeses you're not supposed to eat, although I doubt they're getting feta cheese in prison. Yeah. Um, but there are risks. You can't eat feta cheese when you're pregnant? You're not supposed to. Really? It can cause listeria. Dude, I'm glad. I, I want my kids because <laughs> I like feta cheese. Well, a couple of times I ate it without really knowing I had eaten it, where it was maybe on a salad, and I thought it was blue cheese, and I took a big bite, and it was feta. <laughs> Um, but the, yeah, there are things like that. I don't think that that's the issue. I mean, I think your chances of, of something happening to your baby from just eating lunch meat or feta are so small, but it's, it is a risk. The point that, you know, it's just, if you're hungry and, and when you're pregnant, you have to really listen to your body. And so if you're pregnant and you're in jail or prison and you need a snack because you don't feel good, it's not a guarantee you're going to get it. So a lot of women that I researched after, I talked to her, my friend about it, all complained of the same thing. They were starving the whole time they were pregnant in prison. Wow. You may have friends that, but the thing is this too, 
if you look at the choices they have from the commissary, it's all high sodium. It's not healthy stuff. These people essentially live on ramen. Yeah. Ramen is sort of the base for every meal if that you cook yourself in prison. It's almost like living out of a canteen, like a machine. Exactly. Yeah. And, and the, the other food that you can get, I've said this before, it's essentially kind of like what you would find at the Dollar Tree, if you could imagine it. It's yeah. pre-cooked meat in a foil pack. And they get creative, and we're going to talk about recipes and stuff. But apparently in a lot of prisons, women just aren't given um, a healthy option when they're pregnant. Um, so it's crazy. Yeah, I don't. There. Yeah. It's I don't just even that. know where to. <laughs> no. It, I'm it, speechless. Yeah. Like. It's You don't consider the little things that we do as free women when we're pregnant they're not allowed to do that. They're not allowed to walk to the kitchen and say, hey, I'm hungry. I think me and the baby need some food. I need a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. You know what they call peanut butter sandwiches in prison? What? A choke sandwich. Oh, yeah. I eat those all the time, though. My granny Vera, my dad's mom, anytime we went to her house, we had peanut butter sandwiches. And it's a comfort thing for me, but they are choke sandwiches for sure. No, I'm going to tell you this. There is something that grand mothers do to peanut butter sandwiches <laughs> i don't know what's in it <laughs> you remember in elementary school even the lunch ladies in elementary school they put some it was like honey i don't know what it was, it was but magic. it was so good it was magic yeah it was good peanut butter sandwiches don't hit the same when you're an adult they no. just taste better as a kid but see i have to have milk and then milk runs my sugar up so yeah yeah i don't know oh uh, yeah i bet it does um so in 2019, the American Journal of Public Health said they studied 57% of the female population in U.S. prisons. Now, this isn't jail. This is prisons. 3.8% of newly incarcerated women were taken in while pregnant. There were 753 births to women that were incarcerated in 2019. In 2020, the American Prospect reported an average of 1,300 women gave birth every year while in jail or prison. Wow. I have a family member who's given birth three times in jail, in prison. That's a lot. Yeah. Yep. Five kids and three of them were born uh, there, and she didn't get to see them hardly. Uh, maybe. I don't even know. They took them. They take them quickly. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll talk about all that in a bit. Um, so what's a, how many children right now average in America have a parent incarcerated? Uh, the stats say over 2 million children have a parent incarcerated. That is so sad. It is terribly sad. What um, are we doing to these kids, man? We're, I mean, not, we're not doing our job. Yeah. <laughs> we're failing kids on so many levels right now as a country and a society as a whole. If you look at all these Miss Red Flags that are everywhere. The Gabriel Hernandez documentary lays it out really in painstaking detail. And then the case we're covering with Victoria Rose. Yeah, it's... These kids don't have a chance. I mean, come on. They don't. Um, and um, the sentencing project... Sorry, guys. We, it, it's, we've got the southern snow going on here. Um, my red Jeep is yellow. The pollen's in full effect. And so we're going to be clearing our throats a lot. <laughs> yeah, literally. And I forgot to get water before I sat down. But yeah, it's it's bad. It's everywhere. It's terrible. Yep. It's like uh, chalkboard dust everywhere. <laughs> if you don't have pollen where you live, be thankful. Yes. So you were talking about the sentencing project. Oh, yeah. They say more than 60% of female incarcerated inmates in state prison have a child under the age of 18. Wow. So that's that's a huge number. It just <sighs> these children are being raised by people other than their mothers. Goodness knows how many of those fall through the cracks and and live in terrible situations and and yeah, I don't know the solution. I just know that there are so many kids out there that are at risk and, and we just don't have the number of people we need to have in place to check these kids. And it, you always can say it is you make the child, you take care of it, but that's not very fair to the child to yeah. say, well, your parents had you and it's not our responsibility to make sure you're okay. Yeah. Just if people would follow the law, right. Just follow the law. And 
morals, it doesn't matter what nationality, religion, anything. Morals are morals. Mm -hmm. And just do the right thing. Yeah. There's, it's just a cycle. And I would be interested to look up a statistic of kids who have one or both parents incarcerated while they're under the age of 18. What percentage of those kids, of those, what, 2 million we just said? Yeah. Go on to follow their footsteps. It's a cycle a lot of times that we see. Yeah, vicious cycle. Very vicious cycle. And then it just, it's almost like an heirloom that you pass down from generation to generation. Yeah. I was watching the first 48 last night, as a matter of fact. One of the suspects had kill, um, shot and killed, I believe, uh, he had killed, shot into a car. And there, a, a two-year-old girl was hit and murdered. And then the two other children in the back seat were injured, but they lived. And then the investigator is saying, mother, prison, father, prison, aunt, prison, grandparents, prison. It, it, so wow. when he was, I mean, he didn't even bat an eye. When they said, oh, yeah, you killed the two-year-old. Okay. He didn't care. That was normal to him. It's crazy. <laughs> Crazy. So there is a documentary about prison nurseries. Yeah. So in some places, when you give birth in jail, I think there's maybe a, in 2019, there were 11 states that had this type of setup. So when you give birth, you some places allow you to bring your baby back to jail with you. Now, it can be... Totally from 30 days, you're allowed to have that kid up to six years in some places. And uh, there's a documentary about this. It's called Born Behind Bars. I believe it's A&E that does it, but I think you can find it on Amazon Prime. I have watched it years ago. It was really interesting. Um, I don't, I'm trying to process in my mind how I feel about that. Well, it, you go through all that when you're watching it. I think yeah. in, in it's, first of all, it's reserved for nonviolent inmates. Uh, They can't have any kind of a a felony hold where it's a violent crime and no escape attempts. But the the flip side of that is even if you meet that criteria, there may may not be room in that facility for you to bring your baby back. There's a lot of stuff that goes on, but I'm with you there. What do you think some of the pros are? I'm still trying to process (laughs) it. I mean, obviously the, you can't even say the bonding between the mother and the child because eventually it's going to be taken away. Yeah. I mean, they're going to, I don't want to say age out, but they have to, there's got to be a cutoff school age, you would think. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, creating that bond and then having that broke, that's no good. Yeah. For me, I, I would think you're better off n- with the baby being taken from the get-go because the baby's not going to, no, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, I, I think the one of the only pros I could come up with is it's definitely an incentive for these women who most of them are, are addicts. And I have a huge issue with incarcerating addicts as a whole, but that's a discussion for another day. Um, but I think it gives them incentive to stay clean because they're able to bond with that baby when they're clean. And they're able to be productive in that child's life because that's all they have to do in there. Focus on that child. So does it maybe help somebody who gets out not fall back into addiction because they have discovered being clean and being a parent is more thrilling than however long whatever your drug of choice keeps you high for? I don't know. Yeah, I guess it would be for the for the bonding I was talking about earlier, if the child was going to be placed with a family, like, like the family of the person incarcerated, mm-hmm. and then they would be out of prison before long. Yeah then I could see where that would be a positive because right. then they do know the mom and you know what I mean? So yeah, I, I think a lot of it is studies have shown even when newborns are taken from their mothers, um, they theorize it can cause long lasting issues with the child because you don't bond properly. For me, the one thing I felt re- reading all of this stuff from her, from my friend, is I felt a lot of sympathy for her because any mother who has carried a child for nine months and went through the physical toll and the uh, the hopes you have and to um, 
to have to give that baby up 24 to 48 hours later, regardless of what they've done. I mean, there are violent offenders who don't deserve to have that child. But, sure. But when you're talking about people who aren't violent offenders, even my friend who was involved in a murder, in, in I've, I've said it every episode, which the murder was not pretty. She didn't physically kill anybody. It was an association thing, but still, um, heartbreaking. Yeah. Just heartbreaking. Yeah. Um, the only good thing I can think about women who are incarcerated while they're pregnant and they're addicts is that drugs just aren't readily available. So maybe the kid has a little bit of a better chance of not coming out addicted to something, but being pregnant in prison, it's going to happen as long as you have a female population in there. Yeah. And I mean, there is a drug problem in jail too. So huge. It's not yeah. as easy to get it, but it's, you can still get it. Yeah. So, um, just a whole mess of stuff. We're going to start with our prison slang terms real quick. So the first one is crow, which is look out for other inmates committing crimes. Um, front porch, which is the area immediately in front of a cell door. I, I like that. Yeah. Um, Fishing, a method of sending items between cells using string. Have you ever seen them do that? I have not, but it is I a, did ahead. watch Escape from Alcatraz. <laughs> There's my movie uh, reference <laughs> of the funny. podcast. That, it, it, it is like a sport. Those guys can take a string and a letter and whip it around and go right underneath the other person's cell door. It's crazy. Huh. So what's so, another one? Uh, on vacation is being in solitary. <laughs> and in the car is you're in on a deal. Yeah, I love the prison slang terms. Some of them are very creative and we're just not going to talk about them on here because we try to stay family friendly. But man, there are some that are great. Yeah. So you found some recipes. Well, my friend sent me some examples because I'm quite intrigued with how inmates are able to get very creative. With their cooking. Are you still on that kick while you want to go spend two or three days in the in the jail cell? I never said two or three days. I said I would do one night, but you got to go with. Uh-uh. Come no, on. I read Chad's books. That was enough jail for me. <laughs> so now it's your turn. Your I turn. would totally go spend one night as a free woman in jail just to see what it was like. I would take one for the podcast. No. See, but something I would, rat would you happen. <laughs> Know, Something would happen and they would lose paperwork. Oh. <laughs> the power would go out. There would be a <laughs> shutdown of the whole prison for two months. Oh, you're so right. That would be my luck. It would. And you would be stuck in there. It reminds me of American Horror Story when the, the reporter goes into the asylum and she gets trapped in there. I, that yeah, would be me. I would I would send you a nail file and your cake. <laughs> a nail file and yeah. my cake. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. So prison cooking is amazing i need to tweet out and facebook some links that show these guys who obviously have contraband cell phones in there mark means we're not saying nothing but it's contraband yeah. maybe their attorney got them privilege yeah to be on the phone and so a lot of these guys actually have tiktoks and they take payment so their commissary accounts are stocked and their selves are wall-to-wall -wall food so she shared with me one recipe that they did just recently. So they take cookies and they crush them. They mix the crushed cookies with Coke. You kind of get it down to a fine powder. And you shake that into a crust. Okay, we're talking about the drink Coca-Cola. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not the white stuff. Yeah, we're you said about... fine powder and I'm like, no, Coca-Cola. Like, I'd like to buy the yeah. world a Coke Coke. Yeah, Coca-Cola. Okay, yeah. go ahead. Sorry. And so they shape that into a crust, and then they mix non-dairy creamer with hot cocoa and a little water, and that's kind of the prison Nutella. Um, sometimes they go fancy and add candy and marshmallows from the boxes, but we watched a video right before we came on of a guy making a prison cake. Oh, yeah. It was Twinkies and uh, um, honey, buns. honey buns and all that. Frosted honey buns at that. Yeah, so they make that uh, crust, and then they layer it with Twinkies or whatever they can find, and they make this paste, and they kind of knead it in a bag, and then they put, like, another layer of that crust on top, and then they sprinkle this sort of nut um, knockoff Nutella on there, and it's cake. The other thing that um, she can make is taffy. 
You can take non-dairy creamer with pre-sweetened Kool-Aid and add drops of water and keep working the mix until you have a taffy consistency. That's just weird. Isn't that crazy? Well, I'm just sitting here thinking, what is in that that makes that do that? I don't think it's healthy. <laughs> no, it's If you could take healthy. non-dairy creamer, which, <laughs> what is non-dairy creamer? It looks dairy, but it's, it's non-dairy creamer? It's powder. Yeah. Non-dairy creamer. Yeah, non-dairy, yeah. And pre-sweetened Kool-Aid. Yeah, it sounds like yeah, it would not weird. only rot your teeth, but it would... You're going to die. It would, it would jack your sugar up to oh, like... Yeah. No, you're going to die. That stuff's going to kill you. <laughs> That's going to kill you. Uh, her specialty is stir fry, fried rice, pasta salads, and Thai food. And she also says she can do desserts like a peanut butter finger, peanut butter, butterfinger cheesecake, and a version of a maple but goody, whatever that is. I've never heard of a maple but goody. It could be a prison thing. Does anybody know what a maple but goody is? Let us know. Um, yeah, I have no clue. So let's get on to uh, birth in jail. Let's see what happened. She went in at about five months pregnant. I asked her this weekend, and she said she was five and a half to six months. Wow. When when the, the handcuffs clicked. So she found out she was pregnant after several miscarriages. Um, she was scared to get too excited. Um, she joined the online pregnancy board cautiously. Mm-hmm. Um, once she was out of her first trimester, she started working in the nursery. Once the pregnancy progressed, she started interviewing doulas, toured the hospital where she would give birth, and made her birthing plan. So it was basically just normal pregnancy stuff. Yep. Um, when she was six months along, she was arrested for suspicion and non-cooperation. And this was the first time she'd ever been arrested. Yeah, and I think the suspicion and non-cooperation was kind of what we saw with Lori and Chad, which was the alteration and destruction, just to get her in. Um, I don't, I don't think she was charged with murder until a little bit later. But they, but she couldn't post the bail, so gotcha. She had to sit. Gotcha. Um, so she says her faith in the justice system was strong, and she thought she would be home before she delivered. Um, she says she knew who committed the murder and she naively believed it would be sorted out. She was placed in segregation for her safety. Yeah. And, and that's a big thing that a lot of um, like the ACLU and, and these organizations, they have a big problem with being placed with especially pregnant women being placed in isolation just because they're pregnant. You can take. Everything I've read, you can take a person that has the strongest willpower, mind, outlook, whatever, and put them in segregation, and after a few weeks, they're broken. Yeah. And not only that, but when you're pregnant, doctors don't want you to get stressed out. They don't want you to be overly anxious all the time. It's not good for your baby. Yeah. So that was one concern. That I would... I didn't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead. No, you're good. I, I thought I was going to sneeze. Oh. <laughs> Um, I would be interested to see what the birth weights are on babies that are born in prison. Th- that is interesting. To see if that's low. Yeah. If, because they don't eat like they should. Right. So. But statistically, there have um, the last couple of years of all the women that have given birth in prison, there have been no deaths of the mothers. And, I mean, more children make it than not. There were, I think, out of the 700 and something that, that we talked about earlier, yeah. um, maybe I think 40 of those were stillborn and you had three die as infants. But statistically, it seems like, you know, they're doing okay. Yeah. Ish. Yeah. So it says, uh, she says she was waiting for a guard to come to her cell. Um, where was it? Oh, and tell her <laughs> she was free to go. Mm-hmm. Um, the stress of being in jail caused her to have to be seen a lot due to dehydration and decreased movement with the baby. Yeah. So most of these facilities are not equipped to handle pregnancy. So they take them to community based places. I would assume maybe a clinic or some kind of a, uh, I don't know what you call them, like a pregnancy resource center where they have education and that kind of thing. Yeah. Just to get the checkups. Parenting center, maybe? So. Yeah, something like that. Uh, but they obviously would have to have doctors staffed because they don't send prisoners out for those kind of clots. You can take them while you're in there if they offer them. Um, she just, 
felt like the, the days kind of turned into weeks and then the weeks turned into months. And then she realized, I think at that point, she had, her charges had been upgraded. And she knew that she was going to have this baby while she was incarcerated. Um, she said the hard thing for her was at night trying to sleep, but you would hear inmates that were in the middle, you know, in the middle of a mental episode screaming and going crazy. And, um, or you would just have people that were emotional and crying. And she said she would try to just cover her belly so that her baby wouldn't hear it. Wow. Um, she felt like after all this time, the hardest part she was knowing that the baby that she had hoped for for so long would be born to a detainee and that there wouldn't be any special welcome and her family wouldn't be with her and her birth plan where she wanted certain types of music played and all these things women plan for when they're in the birthing process. It, they don't care about that when you're a detainee. Yeah. And so because she couldn't post bail once her charges were upgraded, um, her birthing plan, she said, essentially became the sheriff's office plan of wow. how they're going to do it. Um, it's, it's, I remember being in my third trimester and I, you're just so excited. Then you're anxious because especially with that first baby, I had been around a lot of newborns when I did my rotations in surge tech. I did a lot of time in labor and delivery and newborn nursery, but you're still, it's you. And you've never had a baby, so everything you know kind of goes out the window because you don't know what labor feels like till you felt it. Yeah. And so she's having to do all this on top of the last few months of pregnancy, which are just hard on the body. She's laying on a metal cot with a very thin pad. I can't, there's so many things about it I cannot fathom having yeah. to deal with. Yeah. So all the um, extras that you need while you're pregnant, you don't have. You don't have. I mean, by seven, eight months, I was sleeping with a body pregnancy pillow. I mean, it's just I would drape my leg over my husband to relieve pressure on my back. I mean, it's just you can't get comfortable in a fancy mattress, much, much less on a cot. Now, the one thing I did want to say, we fully understand that the victim in this case, her mother grew her for nine months, gave birth to her, raised her only for her to be killed. Yeah. It, it's cruel and yeah. it's sad. And we're not minimizing that at all. Um, as a mother who's done this three times, I've had one natural and then two C-sections. She had a C-section, which I can't even imagine. We'll get to that later. Um, we're just giving you her experience. And as a mother, I do feel bad that this was her experience that's a consequence of her actions, but on a basic human level, um, yeah. knowing that mother bond when you're pregnant. And I mean, the minute they put your kid in your arms, your whole world changes um, yeah. for the better. Yeah. For her, it was for the, the most painful. I think with, with any case that we're covering um, or that we read in the news or whatever, it's why it's so important to hang around good people Yes, and to make sure uh, who you're around, um, because their bad decision can also affect you too. Right. And, and you were in here 30 minutes ago when I was telling my son who will be driving in less than a year about a story, uh, a guy had, or a 17 year old young man had been given a Mustang by his mom. He started racing with a friend of his. And I think the speeds ended up well over a hundred. I'm going to say like 140. And there was a mom and her baby that were crossing a road out on a walk, and he hit and killed them both. One friend pled down that didn't hit her, and he got six years. And so the judge sentenced this kid last week to 24 years in prison for two counts of, I think, vehicular homicide. So this kid wasn't even a criminal. He yeah. made one stupid decision to go racing on a street, yeah. 24 years. The flip side of that is he'll get out in his 30s and still be able to have a family and do all that stuff to where this woman and this baby will never grow a day older than the day they were killed. Yeah. But it is. It's not only who you hang out with. It's stupid decisions you make in a blink that can mess up your whole life. Yeah. Follow the law. That's my mommy talk for now. See something, say something. Right. Don't try to hide it. Yeah. 
Um, so she was told there would be minimal medical staff and two deputies present at the delivery. Um, when she asked if a family member could be there, she was told she was an inmate and policy would dictate how things went. Mm -hmm. She was a scheduled C-section. Um, I was for my middle and last child, my son decided to get stuck. And so I had to have a C-section, which my doctor was more comfortable doing a C-section on my last baby. I cannot even begin to imagine after 48 hours being released from that hospital and go back to that metal bunk with that little pad when you have staples across your stomach, your hormones are crazy. I mean, breathing hurt for two weeks solid after my C-sections. Yeah. And not only that, you're, you're sharing a room with women who don't care. Yeah. They don't care what you just went through emotionally. Oh, they've lost their kids too. Yeah. So it's not like you're in a the minority there. Out in public, if a woman loses her child in a tragic way, especially... Women hover and they kind of embrace those women in prison. You, they do not care. Yeah. You're not going to get support from anybody. Zero. You're yeah. on your own and you're on your own, not only with your physical pain, but with the emotional pain of having that baby taken. Yep. So to go to the hospital, she was cuffed and shackled with leg irons. Um, she had arranged for someone to take her baby home once she discharged uh, she didn't want the baby to go into foster care. Um, her hope was that the legal situation would get sorted out and she would be able to reunite with her newborn shortly. But uh, that never happened. Yeah, and I think her kid is probably 11 now, 10 or 11-ish. And um, she knew the person that, that the baby was going with. Once, once it became clear that she wasn't going to get out, she really wanted her her baby to go with family here in South Carolina, but uh, it, it didn't happen. Yeah. So she hasn't seen her baby in eight years. Wow. All right. So most of the staff at the hospital tried to make her comfortable. Um, the most supportive was the hospital doula. Um, and we know a doula is someone who provides physical and emotional support during the delivery process. I've got a couple of friends that do that. I would love to be a doula. You would be good at it. I love working labor and delivery. And yeah, I would love to be a doula. No, I'm good. Check, please. <laughs> you go. You, you couldn't even feel my babies when they were kicking in my belly. Uh -uh. I thought you were going to throw up every time. Oh, I said, well, you made me feel, it was Sarah Rose. I don't think I felt the other two. Mm -mm. It was Sarah. It was Sarah. And I felt that one time and I said, that is the freakish. <laughs> <laughs> thing that there's no way that people don't know they're pregnant. Uh, I don't know. My grandma did not know until she was almost seven months old with my aunt. Uh, she seven, felt you mean seven weeks, seven months, seven pregnant? months. She was big. Like the baby was cooking real good uh -uh. in there at that point. It's denial. <laughs> it's yeah. denial. Cause I felt that. And I was like, no. Do you remember you could look across? Cause Sarah Rose was my most active baby. She would do, like acrobats in there. Do she you still does. Yeah, she does. <laughs> Except she's not in there. But you could be across the room and see my shirt moving. Oh, yeah. It was crazy. And then you'd be like, ooh, gross. No, gross I gross. said no. <laughs> There's no. Mm -mm. Yeah. No. So um, the doula held photos of her loved ones so that she could see familiar faces as she got ready for her C-section. And she also took pictures of the whole process for her. Go do. And so when it was time to go in the operating room, she was unchained from the bed, but her ankles were chained to the wheelchair to get wheeled into the operating room. I'm telling you. Mm. This is anybody who is thinking about doing like breaking the law. They need to listen to this podcast. Yeah. Um, so when the chains were removed to get her onto the table, because when you go back for a C-section, they wheel you in a chair and then you get up on the table and get your epidural. And then once you're good and numb, they start cutting you open. Um, but the guards were right there in case she tried to run. And so when she was given her epidural, once they confirmed she was numb, only then were the shackles removed from her legs. Once the epidural had taken effect and she was numb from the waist down. Okay, I'm going to say this. I'm just going to go there and say this. 
I don't know what pregnant woman is nine months pregnant and they're going to be able to outrun the police. <laughs> no, I, I, I mean, I'm just saying. I would have looked like an Oompa Loompa <laughs> trying to run. I mean. You would look like uh, uh-uh. Violet on Willy Wonka when she <laughs> swells up like a grape. I would get somewhere faster if you turned me on my side and rolled me at nine months pregnant. Yeah. I could not have ran. Uh-uh. Yeah, I understand policy, though. That baby would have come out, like, as I ran. <laughs> I'm just so, saying, unless the, never mind, I'm going to hush. Okay, go ahead. So in 2018, the First Step Act prohibited the use of restraints on pregnant women held in federal prisons. This doesn't apply to county jails and state state prisons. In addition, at least 29 states have passed laws prohibiting this pa- practice, though they're not always enforced. Yeah. So it doesn't, doesn't mean that you're going to get any preferred treatment. Well, if you're a inmate and you go have to go into the hospital, you get chained to the bed anyways. Yes, I have been in the ER when they have had uh, detainees in there, whether it be a DUI or or whatever, and they're chained. And you have cops stationed right outside. Yep, I had to serve a lot of papers on people like that. Mm. And uh, it was not fun. No. Uh-uh. So she said when she first heard the baby cry, it was almost as if the baby was protesting the way she came into the world. She said, that's how I interpreted that first cry aside from it being sweet and satisfying and fulfilling. But she, she, her first cry, it just made her think, look at how this child's coming into this world. Yeah. And, um, she was allowed to hold her for just a few minutes there in the operating room and the baby was taken away. Um, the baby had to stay in NICU for a little bit. I don't know. And I tried to email her, but with JPay, which is the, the way inmates communicate with us through email, it hasn't, sometimes there's a delay. I wanted to ask her if the baby was put in NICU just because of the situation and, and the baby couldn't be in the room with her all the time. It seems like that. But when she was taken to the NICU to see the baby, she was shackled to her wheelchair. And once she was there, the shackles were removed from the wheelchair, and then she was shackled at the ankles. So, So you're in there with other families who have babies in the NICU who are premature, whatever reason they're in the NICU, and she is shackled right there among these families. I'm going to tell you, if I'm the other family, I'm going to be a little worried. You know what I mean? Like, not for myself, but... I, w- I think it would be stressful for other families to see all that. I think, think so. Because they're not going to know what she did. It's not a... Right. And some people might not look at it as a stigma of, oh, she's an inmate. But it's uncomfortable. Yeah. I- I'm sure it's uncomfortable for the other families because you're there with your baby who's sick. And here's a woman in shackles who is, I mean... And you don't know what she did. and Right. I mean, exactly. it's stressful enough. Mm-hmm. So then you got that on top of it. It would be hard. Yeah. For sure. Um, yep. uh, so not all women get to stay with their babies in the NICU. Um, some are discharged 24 to 48 hours later, depending on how you delivered. Mm-hmm. Um, she remembers shuffling to the bassinet and hearing the clinging of the shackles. Uh, the other families would stare at the shackles. Yeah. And that's what we just talked about. It's, yeah. Um, it's awkward. You don't, I, I think for me, I wouldn't know whether to feel sorry or what to feel. It's a, yeah. NICU is a very stressful place and a lot of really amazing things happen in NICU. Um, but that probably just added another layer. Yeah. Do you look, do you stare, do you act normal? Do you try not to look, which makes it obvious you're trying not to look. Yeah. I mean, just, yeah, it has to be stressful on everybody in there. Yeah. And and the thing for her is she said every single visit for those 48 hours was so emotional because she just didn't know at what point they were going to say, okay, you're discharged. Yeah. Usually after a C-section, it's two to three days. That's, yep. that's about the max. If you otherwise have a normal delivery, it's about two to three days. And then you're gone with your baby if you're not a detainee. Yeah. Um, and, and, but for a natural birth... Without a C-section, she said the typical hospital stay is about 24 hours. So these women have to say goodbye unless they're lucky enough to where a family member takes them home and then brings them in for visits. Yeah. Some of these women go through labor delivery, hello and goodbye, within 24 hours. 
Yeah, that's and you have all the emotions that go along with that too. So. Right. These women, some have postpartum depression. You, I mean, your hormones are crazy. Yeah. I, I, I never felt so out of control of my emotions than just the few days after birth while those hormone levels are, are coming back down. It's a wild ride. So, um, and she said that sometimes these women that come back from giving birth, especially if they have a, a long sentence ahead of them, they give up. They try to kill themselves. They may just start acting out. They just don't care. Yeah. Um, so while she was in her room and wanting to visit the baby, she was very emotional. Uh, one of the deputies told her that they wouldn't take her uh, to see the baby while she was upset because it wasn't fair to the other families in the NICU to see her upset because her baby was healthy and their babies were not and they were crying. And they were not crying. Were not crying, sorry. Yeah, and I, I sort of understand that. Like you say, if if you have these families that are daily overcoming odds with their children, a lot of these kids are, it's touch and go. They don't know from one minute to the next if the kid's going to have a setback. NICU's just such a stressful place. So I can understand that the deputy might not want to take her in there emotional because just out of courtesy for everybody else. I get that. Yeah. So I guess that answers your question. I, I, it did. And yeah. I, these emails come in pieces. And so sometimes it's just hard <laughs> it's to piece them together. Well, yeah, because I may get part of it. This was sort of a four part email that she sent me. Yeah. And I got part four before I got part one, which was three days later. So sometimes it gets. Read the last page of the book. I knew the ending Spoilers. before the beginning. Spoilers. Um, she would rock her baby and look into his eyes and wonder what color they may be. Uh, she felt staff didn't help her as much because she was an inmate. She did say one nurse was great with her and helped her bond with the baby as much as she could. Yeah, and, and she had given an example of one nurse who she had asked for help with nursing because whether you're an inmate or not, when you have a newborn, the first few days that colostrum is liquid gold. It gives that baby so many antibodies, and so she had asked for help with nursing and the nurse said, why? You're an inmate. You're not going to be here. Wow. And then she had another nurse who said, yeah, let me show you how to do skin to skin. Let me show you how to get the baby to latch on. So you do have sort of, I guess, people that, that, that work in these areas who just see inmates as trash and not worth help. And then you have probably more than not, you have staff members that see you as a human and as a new mother who is about to face something regardless of why you're in something that's going to be probably the hardest day of your life. Yeah. Uh, so she was awoken and told um, that she was being discharged and going back to jail that day. Uh, she had one more visit with her baby. She rushed to memorize every detail of the baby. She says her belief in being released was the only way she was able to say goodbye. Yeah. And she says once she got back to jail, she said two things dried up, my faith and my milk. And I understood that. I yeah. mean, it's because that, that just, when that milk dries up and you don't have your baby, that's kind of, your motherhood is, go I don't want to say gone. She will always be your mother or his mother, but that's the end of your pregnancy and delivery experience. I mean, she's given birth, the milk's dried up, it's over. Somebody else has your child. Yeah. Has to be crazy. Yeah. So she saw her child some for the first couple of years. After that, the visit stopped. Um, she said the worst part for her was when her son said mama, and she realized he was talking about the legal custodian of the baby. Um, so until the trial was over, her parental rights were suspended but not severed. If she was acquitted, she could get uh, custody back. Yeah, and her family did try to get custody of this child to raise with her cousins and with family. My friend feels like she was duped a little bit by this person who took custody of this girl. Um, she claims that she had been told by this person that the guilty person had confessed and she was going to be out of there in a few weeks and she would keep the baby. That's her side of it. Um, but... At the end of the day, the courts did not allow this baby to go with her family. She still writes weekly letters to her daughter. She doesn't know if she gets them. She thinks not. Um, she's, and she still dreams of being reunited with her daughter. Uh, she has some appeals that are going on, but 
after 10 years, she's not going to get her daughter back. Yeah. They're not going to take this child from, and I have seen the Facebook page of the woman that has her, and I've seen pictures of her daughter. She's beautiful, looks a lot like her mom, but most importantly, she looks like she has a very stable and loving home. Yeah. And that's just not what my friend, or he, I'm sitting here thinking about two different kids, but that's just not something that my friend was able to do in any capacity due to the fact that she's associated with the murder and has been found guilty. Yeah. So. And I think that's a lesson to any parent that when you break the law, you're basically, you're not going to have that relationship with any kid, with your kids, you know? No. And they're going to grow up without a father, without a mother, whichever. Right. And it's just hurting the kid. Yes. Um, In 1997, the Adoption and Safe Families Act, which severs the parental rights if the child is in foster care for 15 out of 22 months. That was signed into law, I think, by Bill Clinton. So the exception of that is if the child is with family. But what I was thinking about is this. What about where we are now with COVID? So let's say you have a nonviolent offender who has given birth in jail, but their trial is going to be longer than the 15 to 22 months that that child's been in the foster system. I wonder how that works. Yeah, I don't I don't, I don't know. know. The bottom line like we said, don't don't do crimes, people. Yes. And don't then you do won't it. you won't have to worry about this, but it was very eye-opening for me. Um I think it's a, a thing that that is interesting. Um like I say, there are a couple of documentaries. There's also one on Netflix and I'll have to find the name. But it's a it's an episode series where they actually are in one of these facilities where the children are brought back and raised up to a certain age. Yeah. So those two, what was it? Born. Uh, let me go back up and find it. It was what was it? Born in jail or something? born behind bars. There you go. Uh, so that's one, and then I will try to find the other one that is the episode series. And it, so it's a really good look at how these women function yeah. when they have babies. Yeah. So that's kind of all we have on this. There, There is more, but this really summed it up. I kind of weeded through some of the accusations and things like that because it it didn't matter to what we were talking about. Um, but, yeah, so we're just going to keep doing some of these little A Glimpse at Life series. People are very interested in this. Yeah, and I think it shows. I mean, I know this was on having a kid while you're in jail, um, but it shows the hard reality of it's not a normal place. No. It's not, you don't get to do normal things. No. Um, and these cases that we're following, these people who are found, if they're found guilty, what they're going to be facing, mm-hmm. um, for the rest of their life. Yeah. And so I think the next, unless there's any news with the cases that we're covering and, and we're going to look back at Wagner, we're going to see if anything has developed. Honestly, we've been really laser focused on Vallo with the uncertainty of what's happening with her right now and these hearings being paused. Uh, but if we don't have anything else going on on Wednesday, I think we're going to, I'm waiting on some answers from her about women killers that kill their children. Yeah. And I've asked her a slew of questions about that. If you guys have any questions, please Facebook, Twitter, YouTube them to us and I will send her. She loves answering questions. I think this has given her a little something to do. She is waiting on her appeal. I think last week her case was to have been heard, although there was no oral arguments. It was just going before some appeal board based on a law that was changed in the state she's in where people who were not the murderers but got life without parole under the felony rule can have their case revisited for resentencing. But they accepted uh, the filing to hear the case, but it doesn't mean they're going to change anything. So she's waiting on that. She won't know for a few weeks. I don't see anything online about an update on that. And uh, so maybe she'll know in the next few days she does have a family member that's in touch with her attorney. But, I mean, I, I, I don't think she'll get out. Yeah. She has this dream that she's going to get out and go across the country getting to know her daughter in an RV. And I guess maybe that's how you don't lose your mind, though, in, in, in jail or prison. You just dream. 
Yeah. You imagine what you would do because otherwise the reality of where you are, it, it almost to me would be too hard of a burden. I don't care what they did. Your personal thoughts are still your personal thoughts. Yeah. And, and that feeling of being incarcerated, I guess if you can't dream, then it's just the same old thing every day. Yeah. So you have to hope for something. Yep. All right, guys, I think that's it for us. Um, yeah. Let me know if I should let this stupid cat just out so he will not bother me. If he keeps going at three in the morning, he's getting put out. I'm not even kidding. I'll be like, bye. Let her know, guys. Let Here's her your know. little pack of kitten food for when you get hungry. <laughs> Here you go. You can you can <laughs> feed the cat. The cat's fine. No, I'm just saying, I'm <laughs> going to pack him up and say, oh, whoops, that door's cracked. He got out. And then I can just go lay down and be at peace. There you go. I'm just afraid he'll get hit by a car and I got to pay like 2000 bucks for a broken cat leg. Yeah, that's no fun. My mm-hmm. mom had a cat that got run over like that one time. Had to wear this little <laughs> this little bandage on his like little back end and had his little leg in a cast. Oh my God. Cats are so cute when they have like, they have to walk in casts. Yeah. And wear the cone of shame and it's all fun and games till somebody ends up in a cone. Yeah. I'm going to bring you some of steaks though so you can stake that thing down. So oh. it don't go tumbling. <laughs> it looked like a little tumbleweed going across my yard. The cat the cat just was like, what the heck? What is going on? I tried to get him out. He tries to attack me because he thinks I did it for fun. Because I'm over there laughing. Like, well, was like, the water bowl in there is the question. The water bowl was not in there. <laughs> it was just the cat in the tent. I guess maybe I should have put something in the corners to weigh the tent down. Because I didn't know I had to stake it in the ground. I had it on the concrete. Obviously, you've never been camping. I, I've been, no, not in a tent. I've been in a camper that had slide outs and a fireplace. Uh, that's glamping. Okay, well, I've been glamping. Glamping. No time for camping, but the cat was just rolling across. I mean, see, that's the thing. If I'd ever been camping, I'd have probably went off the side of a cliff if I didn't stake my tent down. Yes, you would have. Ugh. Right off the side. All right, guys. Yep. Well, we're going to let you run, and unless something crazy happens, we'll see you guys on Wednesday. See you later. <laughs>